Now, that's what it was at the, for the very syllables, okay, that are depicted here. That's how history actually was. So when it's predicting for the future, that's how it's actually going to be. A lot of musical chairs, a lot of fighting this faction versus that faction versus the other faction. Okay? That's how it's going to be. That's how it was. This is paradigmal. And of course, it is paradigmal in history. This is exactly what happens every time. Alright? Sometimes more severe, sometimes less severe. But everybody who's involved in it is, is in astonishment. Oh, the thing that fell. Oh, the decline of Rome. Oh, the this. Oh, the that. Oh, I better pick a side so I can be on the winning side when we revive it. See? That's the psychology behind this. Now, everything that ends up happening between 476 and 491, which is the period of Zenos's semi-stable reign. He doesn't get deposed again during that time. Everything in that clause is how people were thinking. And the most, this is what's so awesome about scripture, how it grasps, it grabs little obscure things. And then God had to preserve that history for you to know those little obscure things. The little obscure thing that's happening right during this time. Kai Dao Ma Ste Son Dai. And they will wonder. In the East, it was there wondering who's going to take over. Because Xenos still has f people fighting against him. He just has more control from 476 onward. He still has relatives fighting against him and trying to usurp. So there's a lot of shock and wonder at that. Okay, see, because remember the context of the word shock, okay, is over the Civil War. Christian against Christian. By John here. And now by all the inhabitants of the world. Yeah, all the inhabitants of the world who count are going to be shocked and wondering. What are they shocking and wondering about in the East? Well, I just said that. But in the West, here, Odovacar is Kai. Now, there is still a Senate in the West. They've got two separate governments now, two separate emperors now, now Odovacar has taken over, and I don't know how he decided to do it, or maybe it was just he liked the West, or whatever. But Odovacar sends an embassy to Zeno in 476, wondering, wanting, looking for out of shock will you please rule over us now the senate had instigated that and i'm odovacar went along with it and he argued against it and he argued for it he sort of went back and forth he just didn't want romulus or some of the guys that zeno wanted appointed okay he wasn't totally adverse to it Zenos would propose one guy, and Odovacar would say no, and then there'd be another guy, and finally what ended up happening, and this is taking like until, I don't know, 780, maybe it's not quite that long. This is 782 by the time we get to the end of it, okay. All that more shock, and all that more arguing, and all that more musical chairs, but it's, it's, by embassy, it's by discussion, it's not by war. So, you know, wanted it to be by war, but he wasn't having any good success at it, so he finally gave in and settled for negotiation with Odovacar. Finally, it ends up being, during this period outlined in black, that Zeno says, okay, 
I'll appoint you to rule for me. I'll accept your obeisance, and I'm your emperor, but you rule for me. Well, that suited Odebacher just fine. So that's what happened. But because it suited him just fine, what, he, what ends up happening to him is right here, he dies. He gets overthrown. Now what does that tell you? That tells you not to get all this shock about, oh, what's happening and we need to do something about it, yada, yada. That will make a lot of people feel like, okay, well, if I'm on your side and you're on my side, that there's loyalty, yada, yada, yada. But there's no loyalty, honey. Because Odovacar finally gives in to the Senate, which is probably what he wanted in the first place. And, and Zeno has him be the effective ruler, and as soon as that happens, well, they kill him. Okay? So Odebacher's gone. Now, that's not all the story. Because at the same point, it's really here, but it sort of spreads. Zeno, because he's got all this internal struggle to deal with, one of the things he seeks to do, and he's also partially sympathetic to it, as far as his own beliefs go, he wants to stop this Council of Chalcedon thing from dividing up his own empire between the Chalcedonians and the Monophysites. And what is that? Well, that's whether or not Christ is what, has one nature or two. And if one nature, then what is it? How can he be God and be man at the same time? And does that mean he's two persons? You know what? That argument keeps on going on until today. For no good reason whatsoever. The Bible tells you flat. He's God. He's man. He's one guy. But they are the wills of one will or two. How can you be God and have only one will? And yet be human at the same time. So are you less than human or less than God? I mean, hello! God can do anything. What's so hard to understand here? The Hebrews 1 lays all that out real clearly, so I, I never have understood why people are so confused by this. But they were. It was the kind of battle was going on right back up here with Constantine's sons. And it didn't stop. All right? The Council of Chalcedon, in part, was a way to say, well, we're going to take a side on this argument, and if you're not on our side, you're a heretic. Well, what Zeno wanted to do was stop that kind of divisiveness, because half of his reign was Monophysite or Miaphysite, believing that Christ was just, like, one nature, that somehow Godness was magical in it or whatever. And the, versus the Latin, which was saying that Christ is two natures in one person. Okay. But both sides' definitions were goofball. And Zenos was saying, well, forget it. We don't want to deal with this anymore. And so he issued something at this point that he had his Patriarch of Constantinople draw up, not the Pope in the West, called the Henoticon. That's this thing. The Henoticon. Henos means unity. Henotes is used by Paul in Ephesians 4 5. It's usually mistranslated unity. The right meaning of it, which this hap happily enforces, um, means unity with God, not people. It means a harmonious union with God, Henotes. And it was used by Plato in the Philebus, through Socrates' voice, okay. Alright, it's, it's a really pregnant word in Greek lit. And to say unity, it's, it strips it from all the God meaning. And see, it was promulgated in 482, but he had it written up by his... Um, Patriarch of Constantinople, Acacius. 
And what's going to come out of this is yet more civil war. But at the moment, at the moment, everybody's wondering how to resolve the issue, and Zeno gets Cassius to write it up. So they're shocked and amazed that the West falls. They're shocked and amazed about one guy usurping and well, who's going to be the next usurper. And they're shocked and amazed at who takes over. And then they're shocked and amazed and taking sides to get somebody else to be ruling. And they're shocked and amazed at this Christian war of war, blood against blood. Okay? And so here's an attempt to unify all the habits of the earth by basically saying, okay, Christ is God, he's man, he's begotten of God, that's it. No comment on how that works, why that works, or whether it's one or two natures or anything else. Just let's not talk about that. Now, of course, the problem is the Zeno is not the prelate. Zeno is the ruler of Byzantine Empire, a political position. Okay, so everybody got pissed off that the ruler of the empire, even though there's no such thing as church without the ruler of the empire, they got pissed off that he did it. So the people who wanted to sign off on this Henoticon on either side of whether they were Chalcedonian or they were Miaf side, they all got, their, their fellows who believed in the same doctrine got mad at them for essentially caving into the emperor. So there's schisms. More Haimatos against Haimatos. Blood against blood. There's more schism. And there's more shock. See, that's why it's at the tail end. Tai Hoi. The people are all shocked at each other and all worrying with each other and all wondering who's going to win. All the inhabitants of the earth, yes, in both realms, are engaging in this. See that? Now, the most pregnant point to make about this phrase is the way John assigns it. Or, you know, I mean, the angel told him all this stuff. I'm sure those are the real words the angel used. But did the angel put this, this stuff in this order? And John just, like, writes it down as dictation? Or is John repackaging what the angel said at the behest of the Holy Spirit or at the direction of the Holy Spirit because it's also got to align with actual historical events that help you understand what's meant by these words. I don't know. Okay. It could be that, the, that you know, the way the angel said it the first time, John's just writing it in order. And, of course, the angel would know what the words would mean how they're going to relate to future history, or whether John was given to repackage it based on future history, and did John know that future history? I don't know. But, it is deliberate. And how do you know? Because, and this is this goes back to something you'd have to already know, everybody's heard of 490 in Daniel 9. But what people don't know, and as far as I can tell, I'm the first one to discover it, at least in Western Christendom. What they don't know is that God has measured time in 490 plus 70 plus 490 year increments ever since the fall of Adam. Now, hopefully it's going to turn out that my so-called discovery is really something that a lot of people knew prior. And the only way that's going to be known is if we find more manuscripts or something. I'm desperately trying to find who knew this prior to me. Obviously, they knew it in Bible times because they're using the very meter that, that ties with Daniel. And I've already done so many videos showing how you can see it in the Bible. But... 
once you see it, whether you see it through me or through somebody else who's later going to find stuff, because, you know, I'm not a scholar. You know, I have to be a scholar to count syllables. But once you see that it's done, you see that's deliberate. And why is he tagging 490 from Christ's birth? Because 403 plus 88 is 491. And I'm going to explain why 491, not 490. But that is tagging 490 years from Christ's birth. Christ was born at the end of the Roman year. Okay? So if John is using a fiscal year that's based on September or April, well, really, um, late September and late, late um, March, then that would be considered 491 on that calendar, not 490, beginning of 491, which is the same thing as saying the end of 490, but you can't split a syllable. And if he uses, if he uses 491, if he adds one syllable, like he could have taken out this. He, instead of saying epites gays, although that's a common way to say it, he could have just said epigays. And it would be exactly 490. But see, Zeno's reign ends in 491. Okay? Ends in 491. So he's, he's coupling the 490 tag, which I'm going to explain in a minute, with Zeno's reign. So there's something like characteristic about the ending of a 490. That's the point that John's making. During this period outlined in black. Okay? How a 490 ends. Time is developed in 490 plus 70 plus 490 increments. You've hopefully heard me cover this many times before. During the 490, one person somewhere on earth needs to super mature in knowing Christ. If they do, then 490 years is a time grant future of that date to the world. They also have to super mature during a current 490 that somebody else won for the same reason prior. If that all happens, then the new 490 is going to start 70 years later because there's an interim 70 that is basically a voting period for the world to decide amongst believers only if they want to know Christ. This is the whole origin of the sabbatical years in, in Judaism. The whole origin of why God ordered sabbatical years for um, Israel. Because it wasn't until Israel that sabbatical years were ordered. But this rule of 490 plus 70 plus 490 preceded Israel, started with Adam's fall. And we have records in the Bible of who voted during the 70 year period. Well, first it was Noah, and then it was, it was, it was Moses, and between them it was Abraham. And after, after Abraham it was, I forget who. Okay? Well, actually, it probably was Moses. I'd have to go back and look. But I mapped it. I mapped it in Genius.xls. So you can see who voted during the 70 year periods per Bible. Because when they give you the years, you just plot the years based on 490, 70, and 490, and you see the pattern very clearly. Very dramatic. Okay. So. The trenchant statement John, through, or the angel in John recording, makes is, Hi, your 490, your first 490, does not end well. Everybody's busy wandering after the beast. Now, he doesn't use the word wandering after the beast. That comes later. But he'd already stated it at the beginning of, of 8. 
So, and in Greek, this works this way. You make a statement the way the, the syntax is working. I don't actually need to go to the rest of the verse to know that they're wandering after the beast because the beast is already the object here. In the accusative case, neuter, the object and the subject are the same. Okay, so it's called economy of, it's economy of words. They're all, everybody wandering all over the world. Okay. They're wandering at the beast. That was and is not. And then poetically he's going to repeat the phrase. But he's already said it the first time. And is about to come out of the pit. And everybody's going to be in awe and amazement and wonder. And I've just explained some of the kinds of awe and amazement and wonder and shock that take place during the years highlighted in black. But the bigger point to get from this is that's how the 490 ends. Now why is that important to know? Well, first of all, because it means it's a historical trend. Secondly, because that historical trend is here verified with actual history. Because this is 491 AD. Measured from Christ's birth, there's another 490 that's measured from his death. But we're just talking about the one measured from his birth. Because Paul did the same thing, measuring the 490 from Christ's birth. Okay, but the third thing. It's also a historical trend because it's in our anaphoric center. It's also a historical trend that recurs. Now, how relevant is that to you? Well, I'd be really relevant to you because our 490 ends in 2130 AD. And one of the trends that is not yet stated, but I could probably back into it when I look at all the rest of this, is that prior to the 490s end, there's a 120 year period that's analogous to the flood with all kinds of warring and, and splitting and civil war between believers in particular that occurs because God's cleaning house because it's the end of a time increment. He's preparing the world for their mass voting period that's the next 70 years. And if there's nobody who super matures during this time, the world dies. That's true right now, too. See, the rapture doctrine has a precedent. And the precedent was always, hello, if nobody super matures, the world dies. Because Satan's busy saying, why are you keeping man alive on the planet if he's not interested in you? And Satan's big deal is to present the world that doesn't want God. That's been his goal from the beginning. And he was real successful at it in the Old Testament. And the idea then was to not only be successful at a world that wants no God, but if it wants no God, then there's going to be no Christ. And first he tried the genetic approach by, you know, weeding out the human race, the human genes. But eight people wouldn't give up on Christ. And he was called God then, you know, the older names for God. Eight people wouldn't give up on that. So they were saved and everybody else drowned. That sets the precedent for history. Okay, so they couldn't stop the humanity of Christ from coming to exist. But now that he's come, they tried to, you know, the demon boys and everybody tried to stop him from getting to the cross and dying properly on it. They weren't able to fix that. So now the next best thing Let's get all the inhabitants of the earth to wonder after the beast. And every 490 years, that's what they're doing. Now, our, the, the, the every 490 years is a little bit different for us than the historical 490. Because every 490 would mean that 980 years after the cross, then double that. So what do you got? You got, well, let's forget the cross. Let's just do AD. 
you have 490 AD, which is what he's benchmarking here. Plus another 490 is 980 AD. Plus another 490. Whoops. Is 1470 AD plus another 490 is 1960 AD. That's where Matthew 25, 25, 25, 10 started. With all that apostatization of the five foolish virgins going to buy oil. And that's why Donald Trump is in office now, because those same people put him in office. It took them 56 years to do it, but they did it. That was the end of our 490, based on every 490. Okay, that's a qualifying period. So by 1960, somebody in the United States or some other country, somebody super mature or we'd not be here right now to talk about it now if instead you measure it from the cross that would be 1990 because 1960 plus 30 AD when he died would be 1990 if it's 1990 I know I think I know who it was who matured because my pastor had more doctrine in him than everybody else I can find so I would vote for him but it could be somebody else. It could be a charwoman. It could be somebody who was paralyzed and in a hospital for his or her life. And they really, really learned Bible because what else were they going to do with their body? And it turned out that, that they made it. Could be. Could be somebody rich. Could be somebody poor. Could be somebody sick or well or a washerwoman or a janitor or a CEO. You don't know. But somebody did or I'd not be here to talk about it. Okay, so do you say that our 490 ended at 1960 from his birth? Contiguous now, 1490, which is what John is measuring here. Or do we call it from his death, which is 30 years later? Or, here's the third version, historical. Okay, so historical from his birth or historical from his death. But John's not addressing that here. He does address it, but not here. In any event, however you measure this, and this one is measured contiguous from Christ's birth, this is the first 490, okay, from his birth, because Ephesians 1 is also using his birth, so, so John is tagging Ephesians 1, 3 here. He's saying, hi, this is a trend in history that everybody's going to wonder after the beast by the end. Okay, now when I said our historical 490 was occurring in 2130, here's how I got that. 2130 minus 490 was 1640, that was the end of the English Reformation, minus... 70 is 1570 that's the beginning of the English Reformation you're beginning to see the connection to believers determine history minus 490 that's 1080 and that was the big rise of the Clooney's again are you beginning to see now we have to minus 490 again because there's 490 70 plus 490 that was the rise of all those monks in France and Ireland and Europe. All right, now we minus 70. And that was the beginning of monasteries in France in particular, but it wasn't just France. It was at that time it was sort of all over. But France in particular because they were doing a lot of Bible study stuff. Okay, so now we minus 490. That's a cross. So that's why I'm saying 2130. But as you can see, from what I've just said, you can measure it differently. You can measure it from his birth, in which case all these numbers are 30 years sooner. And I don't know 
which we should call the official 490 calendar, but I've been measuring it from his death. John's going to do all of those versions in here. So that's why I'm kind of confused. Maybe it's all of them apply. But whichever one you way you want to put it, he's saying here at the end of 490, from Christ's birth, as a historical trend, every 490 from his birth, there's going to be a bunch of people who are jockeying for position at a downfall. Civil War, you know, um, maybe just, you know, musical chairs. And when you look at history, that's been true. Okay? So here, Zeno, in his reign, is the poster boy for every 490. So whenever you see the end of a 490, bingo. This is the trend to look for. You see, this is very much more elevated and yet specific in meaning versus what you've heard in Bible class. All because of knowing the meter. And all because of knowing how God orchestrates time in 490 plus 70 plus 490 increments. Which everybody in the Bible days knew. I hope you can start to see it's deliberate. He's going to do it again. Okay, he's going to keep on, he's going to keep on playing it. He's reconciling it here. He's reconciling it here to a different, different set of 490 books. He's reconciling it here. And he's reconciling it here. So you see, he's doing it in different ways. So, all the world is going to wonder after the beast. Both afterwards and before it comes to exist. That's how a 490's end is characterized. Okay? So, Zeno in particular, and you say, well, then we should know more about Zeno. Yeah, well, basically the story with Zeno was he tried to get everybody to unite under him. And everybody was fractious in step. And that ends up setting the trend of history specifically for the Byzantines. It ends up setting, Byz Byzantium will forever be doing this from this point forward. Rome fell, or we're not what we used to be, or we're all jockeying for each other, to each other for power and shocked at each other for who took over, and we want our side to take over instead, or we're shocked that we won. We're shocked, we're shocked, we're shocked, we're shocked, we're shocked. All the inhabitants of the earth were shocked and jockeying for position. Now you'll notice that if everybody's busy doing that, what are they not doing? Looking at God. And that's where we'll pick up the next increment.